Hi, everybody. We'll start in a couple minutes. I'm okay. <laughs> Hanging in there. Lots of stuff going on at MVC, not unusual. Yeah, I just got done talking with the ICC people in a meeting. Oh, um, let me drop in a link for you guys. Hold on one second. Um, I just got some stuff from the apprenticeship director. I had to work on stuff yesterday, so I can give it to you today. Um, we do have a few companies that are looking right now. So if you can fill out the Google form that's dropped in the chat, um, what we can do is we can get your apprenticeship set up and then for the spring we can get you working with some of these company and you will get paid in the process so if you complete the google form i think she has you attach uh, your resume and information i had asked her to do that then um, we can get you at least get ready for spring okay so this will be for the same internship as uh, no, it, it is it is not apprenticeship she she will contact you and then i think she's going to schedule a short session to talk to mm -hmm. you guys about apprenticeship apprenticeship the way it works is that um they have parallel well it's like work experience course so mm -hmm. basically you enroll in these courses and throughout the courses you work with an employer and uh, they, they pay as part of the contract. And these are entry level positions. So we're trying to negotiate for more, but right now what they're saying is that during probation, they're doing minimum wage. And then after probation, they increase it by a certain percentage. So you're looking at roughly after probation between 15 to, could be higher to 18. Um, I have Converge one that's located in, uh, I think, Ontario, California. They mm -hmm. do IT support for many companies, including cloud. So um, if you are interested, you can fill out the information. I am working, this is for the security track, but mm -hmm. I had also asked her to create one for computer programming track. So she's working on that, but right now, initially, we do have companies that are interested in the IT security area. So they work with Cisco devices and other appliances. So depending on your area, then we would group you with the companies that would be equipped for that. And then simply to get experience throughout so as you go through you have to fulfill the course requirement like cis 25 cis 27 for security and then for the programming side you have to finish completing some of the programming courses you know under mm -hmm. that certificate so this is a different thing i work on multiple things simultaneously so um, i was just curious if they'd have the same information like the resume and everything set up but yeah, that's okay yeah, you can use the same thing, you know, uh, if you have a generic resume and a cover letter, you can upload that. You can also add your profile information so that way, because on Friday, I actually have a meeting with three companies that are interested and I can present directly to them the students that are mm -hmm. the profile of the students. So we take your information and we create a profile on Adobe that looks really nice and then we give it mm -hmm. to the company and then from there what they do is they will say okay you know these are the students that we're looking for then we can move forward with the process so mm -hmm. um, Jennifer McDaniel is the director for apprenticeship she does curriculum that's parallel to our IT CIS courses so, um, you know, that's been going through the process for over a year now. So we're hoping to roll it in the spring because we've been, companies been asking. So we don't, 
necessarily know every company pays a little bit differently so we have to drill down on that next part is how much they're going to pay for what type of job specifically for each company but we have um city of Moreno valley they're looking for some programmers especially in python but you know also if you have want to get into the security area because there are a few people that are retiring and then we have Converge One that does IT services. And we have a couple other companies that are looking for, you know, entry level help desk IT support. So that's where you would, you know, begin your security career because a lot of the times they don't bring you in in security unless you have major experience. So we want to be able to build your experience while you're with us and then even in transition to Cal State San Bernardino or university, um, once you have that experience, it's a lot easier for you to find work on your own or maybe with the school help. So the university will take over at that point, but we hope to give you the experience that you need and you can get paid while you're doing it. So it, it's semester based. So, you know, after, like they said, either 30 or 90 days is their probationary period, and then your pay actually increase after that because they want to try you out and see, you know, and a lot of these jobs are remote. Some of them are not. So um, we have to we have to determine what kind of job that will be fitting for you and what kind of company. So fill out the Google form. I'll have Jennifer stop by and talk to you in a future session. So you can find out more about the apprenticeship program and how to go about selecting the companies that will fit for you. Um, okay. Andrea was curious about two things. Is it only available for MVC home students or is it for RCC as well? And also, um, um, should you fill out if you're interested we, in security? So this, this project right now is for MVC courses. <sighs> meaning that okay. you can still register as an RCC Norco student, but um, it's not like the other internship where you have to be based in a certain, you know, mm -hmm. a certain campus. However, RCC and Norco have their own program for apprenticeship in different areas. I don't know if they're expanding in security RCC. I know that they're working on entrepreneurship with IT, um, which is building your own IT company. That's a little bit different. So if you want, you can contact their air, you know, their program and be able to do that. But if you are interested, if you're, you know, any campus students fill that out, all you have to do is register for the course in mm -hmm. the next semester, and then you'll be able to go through the program. Okay. Cool. So it's not just open for MVC student for now. I, you know, but we want to be able to track like how many students are successfully completing the experience in specific certificate because mm -hmm. that ties back into funding to keep this program going. Even though employers are paying, we got to get the staff working and, you know, everything costs money. So mm -hmm. I'm part of the process because I have to make sure that fund keeps coming in for the program and then the students are able to, to get the experience that they need to in that certificate like the python programming certificate we you know we just articulated with our ucr and uci and some of the university for this class so and as it grows ucr actually took all the courses in the certificate program but they reject some of the other stuff that was submitted by the other campuses so it kind of you know so sometimes the home campus kind of tie back to how the transfer credit will go and if you want more information you can contact me and then you know if I can't get the answer I can get the counselors that handle that to give you the answer so I work with them as well so mm -hmm. um but yeah if you guys are interested make sure you fill out the form and then I get you know I will release this to my other classes and then mm -hmm. I will get the information and I will you know get your file going Okay, so that this is a different project than the internship, the other internships. Uh, okay. Yeah, I was just checking. I wasn't sure, but thank you, Professor. Yeah, no problem. I just want to clarify, and then you will find out more about the apprenticeship. We'll have a flyer and everything and website mm -hmm. information and all of that. So it's still very new right now. Okay. All right. 
So um, as you know, we are doing two in one today. So we have a little bit more of a load. So hopefully we can get it done. I have faith that you can build your program today. I tested some of the program as I was writing it. So um, if you can go to Canvas and download your notes and also your in-class assignment. Uh, wait, I'm opening the wrong notes here, sorry. So CIS, um, it says the lab, but it's, you know, basically we're writing the program. So I'll go into screen share. If you have any question, please unmute and ask. I will check the chat later on. But um, so let's go to the notes real quick. So here's our notes. So to start, I know that the book is a very, it doesn't really give you too much of a fluff, right? It just goes into, it gives you a list of this and that. So I kind of like the book and it's very low cost or free. So, um, but I added some material to the actual chapter, chapter five, because I felt like if we're going to cover this area, I might as well talk about the, all the, uh, the rest of the functions. So um, Python methods, Sometimes what we refer to as functions, and these are the functions that are built into the Python library. Uh, we want to be able to understand the functionality of it, of each one, and to see how we can work with numbers. Because as you go through this course, you will use some of these functions for the other program and also your project. So to start um, in chapter five, it begins with talking about apps from uh, method which returns the absolute value of a number. So we can, we can um, assign a negative value to a variable and we can pass that variable as parameter using abs method or function. So in this case, the example that's showing here, I have negative four assigned to my variable. And then I use that same variable in the parameter for that method abs. And my output would be positive because it's returning only the absolute value of that number. So if you, if you assign it a positive number, it's still going to return a positive value. But if you give it a negative value in assignment, then you will get a positive output. So our output here is four because it, it changes right, the value from negative to positive as it returns. Now you can do this in shell. You don't have to write the program in text editor, but if you do write it in text editor, you can simply have it print. Um, so I'll open up idle so you can see. And if we start with shell, if we say, you know, my variable is negative four, right? We simply declare that variable and give it a, an assigned value, which is negative four. And then we do apps method. And then you just simply pass that variable. So when you do this, it just tells you that it's four. And you can, so, you know, some stuff we can do in shell and, and set other methods we have to use the text editor. So this method simply returns the absolute value. So in the first question, it asks you to write a Python program or script that returns the absolute value of negative 288. So our expectation, so when you write any program in any language, you should know what your expectation would be, like what should be the output. So our expectation in this, the output would be positive 288 or the absolute value of negative 88. That's what the question is asking. So again, you can simply, now if you pass a value in apps, you can also do that. But you know, since we talked about variable last week, I wanted to make it a little bit proper. So you can just say variable, one, let's say, is equal to negative 288. So we give it an assigned value. 
and then we simply do apps method and we pass the variable again right and it should return to a8 so once you have that you simply take the screen capture of it and add it to below to the below area of number one so here we would use the abs method as shown in the first on the first page of our notes okay pretty straightforward you can follow the example you can test out and everybody writes a little bit differently so um, you know as long as you use the apps method i'm fine with that okay and have 288 as output any question with the number one of our lab So in the next method, in the next method, we're going to use, and if you're familiar with JavaScript and Java, you have similar built-in method that does this, right? JavaScript, I, I, when I taught JavaScript, I've seen this too. So seal is going to return ceiling value of the number. Important things that you need to make a note of is when you're using the method that's rounding, right, giving you an estimate of the number when it rounds off the decimal, you have to use the math library of Python. So you would import math. That's going to be the first line, right? And then you would declare your variable. Let's say that I use 3.56. And I would print, but here you need to pass it with the method. So you have to have, or the object, you have to have math.seal. So what you have is you would use the method that's part of the math library, and it's going to bring down the value, which is 3.56 here. So when we print, we got to make sure that we include math.seal my var or your variable name and the output for this would be four because it's going to round up to the whole number that's going to be the ceiling which is higher than 3.56 so when you use the seal what happens is going to return the ceiling value which is a higher value than what you originally assigned which is 3.56, so it's going to round up. And for the floor, for the floor, it's going to return the floor value of the number. Again, we would have to import math. So in this case, I put down the variable fruit price is 4.56. And then I wanted to print the floor value of 4.56. So when you use floor, it's going to round down from 4.56 to 4. OK, so in this in the first case, we use seal. So it's going to round up and then floor it's going to round down to the whole number, which is 4. So in the case where you need to make that decimal in and you want it to, to return whole number value, then you can use these methods, but you have to import the math. Okay, so for the next question, it tells you that on weights, 187.13 pounds. Write a Python program that display his approximate weight in pounds using seal and floor methods provide screen capture of script and output so you can simply start with assigning the 187.13 to hit weight variable right 
think I have it created already. Let me see. I'll just write another one. So I open my text editor, right? You can add the comment at the top if you want. So we can say Python program to display. Wait. Using seal and a floor. Okay. So with this, we can start with, we can say J weight is equal, oh, I forgot the import math library. So we need to import math. And then from there we can declare so 187.13 and then you want to print it as the example show right here so once you declare it you can print and you can do two prints print math seal so i can do And here in the parameter, we want to add his the variable. Okay, make sure we have the appropriate parentheses closure there. And then again, we can print math uh, floor J. Okay, so we simply declare the variable j weight, well, in my case, and then I assign it the pounds that was given in the problem, 187.13. Then I simply print, right, the seal, the ceiling value and the floor value. Let me throw this onto my drive. You can save it anywhere you like there. So I can just call this weight.py. So it shows, and you can be more thorough. You can say print, right? Seal, ceiling value is, and then comma, the variable. So we can modify this to be a little bit more clearly, but here it shows 187, I mean 188 where it rounds up and then 187 where it rounds down. Okay. So I want screen capture of code and output. So you can refer to page one of the notes on how to use the ceiling and floor method, the seal and floor method. So for question three, it says Pamela purchases 6.492 pounds of beans, which costs a dollar 48 cents per pound. Write a Python program that display the cost of the beans using the round method provide the screen capture of script and output. So let's look at the round method. Next is the round method. It rounds off the given number of digits and returns the floating point number. If no number digits is provided for the round off, it rounds off the number to the nearest integer. So here we would again import math and I had declared a variable fruit weight is 11.6792. And then I simply do a print and I use the round method. Let's 
So let me add this to the sample. open the I think I have one for RAM so what I did here I want to show you is that I had declared a variable called fruit weight like the example in notes 11.6792 then when I print, I use the round here. Now, what you want to put this value so that way you can control the decimal. So when I print, I simply say print round and then pass the variable here. And then I use the, the value here to control the decimal points. So as I run this, you would see that it rounds to the 11.68 as we had assigned it 11.6792, okay? So you want to include the, the value and the parameter to control how you want it to be rounded as decimal points. So I wanted to round it to the two decimal points, so it gives me 11.68. Okay. Any question with round? Okay, so for the next one with the beans, number three, you just have to declare the variable. Then you assign it the value that's given 6.492. But we have to calculate the cost of the bean, so we have to multiply the, the pounds by the cost per pound. Then we need to round it. Okay. So I think I have one for beans that I created previously to test. So let me open it so you can see. So let me close this. Okay. So here is my beans program. I put bean weight is 6.492. My bean price is $1.48. The total cost is bean weight times bean price. Then I did a print and I used round. And I passed total cost because that's actually the cost of six pound 0.492. And I wanted to control it with two decimal points. So when I run this, right, and you can be more thorough, you can say, so I'm gonna fix this real quick to make it look nicer. The So you can add a little blurb in there if you want, or you can leave it as it was before. And be able to pass it that way. Okay, like I have it earlier, it would be like this. So it's simply print out, it's simply print out $9.61. 
0.46 pounds and 0.492 of beans. Okay. Pretty easy. So here we use the round to round it off and we can control the decimal points with that. Okay. Any question with three? Okay, so no question. Click a few lines so you can do it quickly. So we saw how to use round. So let's talk about max and min. So with the max, this work with a list or a set of numbers. Max is going to return the largest value in the set. So you can quickly determine what's the highest value in that group of values. So in my example, I have 10, 50, 20, 80, and 30. Now this is easy because there are five values, so we can quickly say, oh, 80 is the highest, right? We, we can already point that out. So what I have here is I have a variable called highest value. And I simply have it assigned as max of my list. So I bring down the list name here in the parameter of the max method. And then I just simply print the highest value and it's going to give me 80. And going in, in the other way, we can use min method to return the smallest value in the set of numbers. So in, on, in this list, we have 3, 5, 9, 11, 2, and 4. And remember, when we're using list, we need to use this, the square bracket, square brace. So we would have num list. We assign it the values. And then again, I use a variable called lowest value. And here I would have the min method and I pass the num list here in the parameter. Then I would print the value, which is two. Okay. And on this one, you don't have to import math library. You can simply use it because that's already a built-in method. So in the next one, you simply create a list that contain the quiz scores. Then you would use the min method and the max method to determine the lowest and the highest score. And it doesn't have to be pre-sorted like, you know, some of the other methods. So it can quickly find which number is the highest. And we can see based on that short list, we can say, oh, 94 is the highest. So with the max method, it should return 94. And with the min method, it should return 61. Okay. Any question? And how can we apply this, right? We can apply it in many ways. We can, you know, in the case where if you're trying to write a program to qualify people for certain things, right? Like they have to have a minimum age, or if you're trying to determine the lowest value in a data set when you're doing research, or the maximum value, 
So here's some um, min one that I created. Okay. So it tells me two based on that list. So you can follow the example and create a program for Lila score to determine the lowest and the highest score that she received. From a faculty standpoint, right, how can I make it be useful for me? Well, I can make a program where it would find the student's lowest score and then we can remove that, right? Because some, some instructor, they would, you know, uh, they would remove one of the lowest score for the students. Okay, like they would drop the lowest score on a quiz for the students. So there are many ways that we can apply these type of methods. Okay. Any question? So I like it that, you know, we can use the, the method that is built into Python, right? So you don't have to start from scratch. And Python has a wide library, so especially working with numbers. Okay. So let's talk about sum. So with the sum, what it's exactly what it means. It's going to add the items of an iterable and returns the sum, which is the total. So what you have to do is, let's say that you have a list. It would, it would add all the values in that list. So you need to include that list name here. Now, if you don't have anything to start, okay, then if you leave that blank, it's, it's just assumed that that will be the default zero. So what do we mean by start, right? Like, let's say that you have already $10 in your pocket to start. And then you go from house to house to ask for donation. The first house gives you $1, the second house gives you $2 and so forth. So when you have that start, you would put that $10 as a start value. And then the list of the donation from all the houses is gonna add those up, okay? So that will be an example. Now it's gonna iterate from left to right and it's gonna calculate the total. So in that list, let's say the first house I get a dollar, the second house I get two dollars, third house and so forth. So what, you know, when I'm down to the seventh house, I have seven dollars donated from that seventh house. Then we add everything up, right? So it's gonna go from one to seven and then if we include the start value, which is $10 before we got the donation for all the, from all the houses, then it's gonna also include that 10, okay? So what that does is here's an example. I have one, two, six, three, and four. When I print some val, it's gonna add from left to right, one, two, six, three, and four. Now, if I do a print sum val, and I start it with a nine before that list, so it's gonna add that nine along with the values in the list. So the first output I have is 16, and the second output I have is 25. Okay, so let's look at the assignment. Sonia ran two miles on Monday, three miles on Tuesday, five miles on Wednesday, and eight miles on Thursday. Write a Python program that displays the total miles that Sonia ran using some method. 
provide the screen capture of script and output. In the previous week, Sonia ran 10 miles. Edit number 5A program to calculate and display the total miles Sonia ran in two weeks using some method. So we had, Sonia had 10 miles to start from week one. And then in week two, she ran two, three, five, and eight miles. So we have to find the sum of week two. Then, you know, so here, so there are a few ways to approach this, but we wanted to make it as efficient as possible. Right? Let me close my beans program and the other one. Okay, let me open. I think I wrote one. So when you approach this for A, all you have to do is get the sum for all the miles that she ran from Monday through Thursday. So here I have, this is the number five. So I have week two. Week two list contains two, three, five, and eight. Those are the miles that she ran from Monday through Thursday. And I print miles ran in week two. I have a sum and then I bring down the list. So it will iterate from two, three, five, eight, right? It's going to add those up and it's going to give me the sum. Then I print again for 5B, total miles ran in two weeks. I would use the sum method. I include the list name here, and I have the start value, which is 10, because it says that in the previous week she ran 10 miles. So we would have miles ran in week two is 18. That's for the Monday through Thursday that was given. And then the miles ran for both weeks because we have 10 to start. Sonia had 10 from the previous week, so it's 28. Okay, so three lines for this program, very simple. So here we use the sum method. And if you don't have any start value, if you leave that empty, then it just assumes that it's zero. But if you have something of value to start, you can include it by using the separator, which is the comma, and then add the value there in the parameter. It will add that together with the list that was, the values in the list that was assigned. Hey, um, sorry, I got lost for a second. Uh, mm -hmm. But what, what's what's the ten for on the end of the of your code? It's the ten is the start value before that list. So she had ran ten miles before that week. Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Another example for this would be, let's say that you have $10,000 already in your saving, right? And then you start tracking your saving each month after that. So if you have 10,000 10, to start, that will be the start value. And then the first month you are able to save $200, second month and so forth. So the list would include the saving for each month and then when you sum it up, your start value is $10,000. And then the list of 
the, the list which contain your saving values for each month. Okay. So it would add that 10,000 along with each month saving. Any question? Okay, that's number five, where we use sum. All you have to do is, if you write it in all one program, just give me one screen capture, it's okay. Any other questions? Okay, that was for number five. Okay, so the next part of our notes, it goes over exponential or power or power method. So when we have pow x, y like this, it's gonna return the power of x to y. So your base number is x and the exponent is y. Okay, so it's x to the y. So an example of this is to print PAL32. That means that we are actually doing three to the second power, right? That will give us nine. Now, additionally, your text doesn't have this, but so if you have three in the parameter x, y, and z, it's actually equal to x to the y mod z. So the percentage symbol here is modulo, right? So simply when we do print pal four to three, then we would have four to the second power, which gives you 16, then mod three, which gives you the remainder one. So when we say mod three, what does that mean? We would take that value divided by three, which is 16 divided by three, gives you five as a quotient with the one remainder. So it's gonna output one. Okay. And you can also use your calculator to check to make sure to validate it. But, you know, the idle, the shell, you can use the shell to be able to calculate things as well. So it accepts number. So we can use PAL to be able to return the value after it's applied to the exponent. And then on this one, when you're using three, right, values in the parameter, it's simply gonna take the first value as the base, the second value as the exponent, and the third value as the modular value. Modulus value. So that would be for PAL method. Okay, so for A, write a Python program that using PAL to calculate and display the results for 6 to the 3rd, 20 to the 6th, negative 254 to the 5th, 9, 12 to the 2nd, and negative 12 to the negative 8. So I think I have one pre-made to save me time. So here's my number six. I simply have print pal six comma three because the base number is six and the exponent is three. 
similar to other languages, of course, if you if you use this with JavaScript or C++, right? Then we would have print pal to the 20 to the 6. So my base is 20 and my exponent is 6. Then on the next one, I have print pal negative 254 to the fifth. So negative 254 comma 5. And make sure that you have the double closure bracket otherwise because we pass it through print then again 912 to the second so 912 comma 2 and then lastly we have print pal negative 12 comma negative 8 now I did that next one to, because it's all in one program, but I did a print pal four two three like the example program that we looked at. So when I run this, I get two sixteen for a, right? This value for b, and so forth. And then lastly, with the three values in the parameter for pal. I get a one, which is the remainder, like what we showed in the example. But for six, you only have to do the these right here. Okay. So after you have created your program to display the output of each of those, Take the screen capture of your script and your output. Any question? Oh, we're okay to just write these in the shell, right? Yeah, you can. Uh huh. I just chose to save it in files so I have it to show you. Okay. Yeah, you can use just a shell, like pal and then the, the parameter. Sure. Any question with six? Yes. So, um, I was just wondering, is it possible to write this one line or not? To write what? I'm sorry, Cynthia. Can you hear me? Yes. Did you write this in one line, this code, or is it better to keep it separate? I just keep it separate because it's actually there are different values, but you know. Um, if you have a better approach, because I wanted to show A, B, C, D, E separately, because as you can see, some of the values are lengthy as the output. We don't want to jumble them up and then get confused, especially when we're dealing with data, you want accuracy. So you wanted to make sure that you show each output cleaner, right? And more clear. So I, I opt for it to be that way. But if you want to make it into shell, you don't have to print it. You can just do pal and then the parameter. So each of each line, when you press enter, it's going to run each of the value for you. Another question. Um, hmm? for the, I know for the import math, does that have an option for exponent too or uh, if if you if you create like let's say if you create your own custom library you can import that into a a program like an, another program another module let's say but are you what are you trying to export something you don't need to export anything because the functionality of that library you can just reference it it's a way that we can reference something okay right. I'll yeah. Uh-huh.
I have a question. Yes. Uh, in what case the uh, translate to a number with e something e? Yeah. So in what case? So if you have a very so in this case we have a very lengthy decimal, mm -hmm. right? Like uh, or in, in the case where you have a very large number, e the e just represents that it's times. 10 to that power. So in this case, it will be mm -hmm. 2.3 blah, 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 times okay. 10 to the negative nine. Okay. Yeah, so that means that we, you know, instead of writing the decimal mm -hmm. with all those values, right, with all the 0 0.00002, okay. et cetera, then we can shorten it to make it where it would use the E, Right, so technically that is times 10 to the negative nine there. Okay. And yeah, so it looks a little bit better that way, but that's just um, another way to represent that number. Okay. Okay. So if that's you, that, okay. Yeah, if you want to apply this, right, so let's say that you have your data set because this is going to be a very small number in the scale of the decimal, right? But let's say that you have a data set and consistency in your data set, you have two point, you have this value and then you rerun the test again and you would have another value, let's say 2.6 something E negative eight, which gives you one, one place less in decimal. So you have to mm -hmm. ask yourself, is that accurate compared to the previous result, right? Yes. That will be 10%. It's actually 10% difference. So there's a huge gap. So that makes it look as in, you know, there's inaccuracy somewhere in the test because 10% gap from one result to another is way too big of a gap, correct? So that E actually helps us looking at the decimal placement on the left. If it's E negative 08, it's mm -hmm. actually one decimal less to the left. So that will give us approximately 10% increase in the accuracy of data. I don't know if that translates because I'm trying to tie it to what you're doing. So, so when you do research, if you see that th this exponent value is less, that means that it's one decimal place less from the left. Okay. Let me see my computer. My computer gave, gave me exact. Yes. Exact so, uh, don't give me. Right. Mm -hmm. Because on the Mac, your computer, oh, what mm -hmm. it does is it just plays the decimal with all the values in it. The instruction okay. for that processor, when it takes that data, it didn't, mm -hmm. it didn't translate it to, to the E with like, like mine, right? Because it would place all mm -hmm. the decimal, the zero and after the decimal point. Okay, I okay? see. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Just the different way that instruct the processor mm -hmm. is actually instructed with that for that interpreter. Okay. Any other questions? It's still the same. Mm -hmm. It's just different way to represent it. Okay. All right. For seven, I want you to use the three values in the parameter for PAL. And we need to calculate, right, five to the third mod four. So you should get the output as remainder, okay? So that's mean for A, it's like 125 mod four, right? So B, 11 to the sixth power mod eight, C, seven to the fifth. So the first, so if you write this, I'm gonna go ahead and add it to this right here so you can see, so we can have PAL, right? Five, three, and four, like this, okay?
this would be number seven. That's it. Okay, and you can continue to do that. How? 11, that's the first value for B, six, and the mod value is eight. And so forth. So you can continue to do C and D. Once you have that, you can save and run. Now, if you do it in shell, you can also pass it in shell, which is pal, and then the three values. And we'll get to modulo and random, right? Uh, modulo is important in like creating a program for random number generator. Uh, it's also important in some concept if you wanted to implement like an automated generated number set, or I should say it would be like a sequence, um, especially when you're looking at math sequence. Um, so mod is very common in programming as we would implement that for different use but the common one you would see that would be a random number generator, right? Like a game that you would make where it would throw dice and it would randomly generate a dice value, okay? Or a guessing number game. Okay, any question with seven? Yes. I have a question. Um, so when I ran uh, my code, or when I ran my program, I I don't know if I got the right output. I just got pure one. Is that yes. So so are you talking about A? Yes. Okay. So A, when you do five to the third power, that's a hundred and twenty-five. So when you take 125 divided by four, you would have a remainder of one, okay? Because the mod, this symbol right here, this percentage symbol means modulo. And the output for modulo is the remainder value. So if you take 125, which is the, the output of this, mod four, that should give you one because 125 divided by four gives you what? 31 with the one remainder. Okay. Yeah, so it's only gonna give you the remainder value. So you have it correct. So yes, that's correct. A way that you can check this too, okay. Um, you can use your regular calculator and let me see, I think under, yeah, under scientific mode for your calculator, if you're using Windows like me, right? But all, almost all computer calculator would have different, different mode. So here's the mod right here. So if I take, you can check it, you can take five to the third, which is 125, and then you mod it with four, you would get a one, technically that's a one as a remainder. So 125 divided by four, okay, that would be 31 with the one remainder, 31 as a quotient. So it does, when you're using mod, it's only gonna output the remainder value, okay? Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. And also, you know, I use all positive value here, but you can, like the last one, you can also use negative value, right? With the base or the exponent. Okay, so that will be for seven. And then eight, similar to other language, other languages, programming languages, we would also be able to use square root. So the square root method, 
the SQRT method, the square root method, is going to return the value. The square root, the output is going to be this the square root of whatever, right? So if I have square root of 100, it's going to output 10. So square root of that value. So now we want to import math. And when we print, we can have print math dot square root and then the value you try to out operate. In this case, I use 81, it's going to give me 9. Okay, so let me open my program up. So I did a few here. Let me save this before I close it. Okay. So I import math, I print, this is for 81, this is for 88.21, this is for 560. So here is my output. Okay, for just those three. So I have 9.0, 93.92, etc. 23.664, et cetera. Okay, and that's how we can use square root. Any question? Okay, so I don't know why it's doing this. Let me put it side by side so you can see. Okay, so now depending on, you know, if you're looking at version two or version three, since we're using version three, there are several ways that we can use random module. Um, so this is how we can generate random integers by using randint method. This is a built-in function and you have to include, or you have to import random, okay? Just like how you did with math. So we want to use the random module to be able to operate randint. So this is an example. So we have R1 and we would do random.randint. And here is the range that you wanna put. So Basically, this line, right, tells the interpreter that I want to generate an, a random integer between 0 through 10. Okay. Now, if you read into pseudo-random, you, you know that it needs to really seed. Okay. So when we seed it, we would try to put in the mod for this so that way it would show so here we when we print we would say print random between 0 through 10 is right and it's going to give us the number okay for two let's say that you wanted to do between the range of negative 10 and negative 1 you can also use that in your range Right, so we can use positive number or negative number. So that will be your R2. What if we wanted to go from negative to positive as the range? We can also do that. 
we can do negative five to five and it will generate the number, okay? So this is a way that we can quickly generate a random number and the range value, you simply put it in the parameter here as arguments. So you would have, could be only positive or from a negative to a negative range, a negative to a positive range. And you'll be able to have that. So um, let me open up the example program so you can see. So this is the example program that was created. So when we run this, right, it tells me that from zero through 10, my random number is four, right? And then negative 10 to negative one, it gives me a negative five, negative five to five, it gives me a five. And if you want to make sure, let's try to run it again to see if it's going to give me the same value, right? Technically, it shouldn't. It should give you different values as it generates. So the second time I ran it, I got a zero. Then I have a negative six and then a four. Okay. So that's how we would maybe use ran int. So for nine, it asks you to write a Python program that contains ran int method to generate a random number between zero through 100. Provide the screen capture of your script and output. So you can simply take the first one, like the R1. So if I change this to 100, like this, Right, so I don't have to retype that for you. And then if I save it and rerun it, yeah, it gives me 87. Okay. Oh, I should fix the print, sorry. Otherwise it would confuse people. Does it matter what the letter after the percent sign is? Uh, no. So that's part of your print, actually. Okay. Oh, so what if oh, I just sure. put, I, if, if I just put it like this, right, does it really matter? This right here is just going to actually point back to the variable that holds the random value. Right. I have a question. Sure. But for the random part, we have to put the uh, import random, otherwise it doesn't work, right? Yeah, you have to import random because it's using the, the this is a built-in uh, library. Okay. I mean, it's a built-in method from the library. So you have to have import random, otherwise it doesn't work. In what case you put the uh, import mass, import random. So when you're mm -hmm. using like something like round or floor and ceiling, mm -hmm. you would go to, you would import mass. And then when you use random method, mm -hmm. then you would, you would have to import random. It, it is specifically for that method. Okay. Yeah, like ran, ran range or ran mm. int. Yeah, you have to use random. Okay, that's right. I put the import mice. It doesn't work. <laughs> oh, yeah, you have to import random for random method. Okay, yeah, this time works. Thank you. You're welcome.
So if you're using, okay, if you're using the print, going back to the last question, I was stuck on that, sorry. Um, if you're using the print, so this right here is just gonna format for your string, okay? So yeah, the this D and the, the percentage symbol right here is to represent how that string is displayed. So if you just simply put is, and then you can have it pass, with the R because we have it, then you would use the separator there. Okay, that's why it was throwing an error there. So I can still have it that way, right? If you don't want to use this part right here at the end of the, 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 the string that you're trying to display, then you would, so yes, that percentage D is of significance because it actually is a way that we would format that um, that string to be displayed. But if you don't want to use it, you can go back to the traditional way that we've been doing is to have the string and then separate it with the from the variable. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it's like a way to reference the variable. Yeah, and it's just uh, it's just a what yeah for for it to be shown with the variable without using the separator. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So question? Sure. So I guess it's, the, um, she asked about the letter with a percent sign. So mm -hmm. I guess that's different from C++ where they have S standing for string or something and, or. Yeah, what this does is it's, you know how when you have a variable with the string and the parameter, you have to separate it somehow or you have to format it so that way it's, it actually connects, okay? So we would have a string that's display. And then, uh, yeah, so in C++, you would be able to show that as a string, as one piece, and then to bring down the value. So we have to be able to use, uh, like on this part, that's just gonna tie into that variable with that string, so it converts that into string. So yeah, that is a, form, a format conversion. So Python doesn't discriminate whether that represents a string or an integer when you no. put the percent. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a little bit easier to implement the value that way. Yes. Okay. Yeah, just like how it's it, it's a way that we use. So it's a shortcut of the dot format. Remember how we did dot format last week? There was some part yes. that we actually include that percentage symbol. Remember that? Yeah, so it's a it's a shortcut to that format. Okay. The dot format. Uh -huh. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So that was nine. We simply have to generate a number between zero through one hundred, and you would use zero you know, comma one hundred in the parameter. And let's look at doing ran range again with the random function, we gotta make sure that we import that module. So we have to import random at the top. So in the next example for ran range, so ran range, it's return randomly selected element and we can have it start, stop and skip or step. So we would have a starting point like how we did in the previous one, like at zero and then stop at 100. Right, and um, so for the stopping point in the range, we then would add, add in step, and it, so the step is that it would be added in a number to decide the random number. So we want to be able to add in a specific value to decide that random number. So you would have three in the parameter start, stop, and step. So here's an example. So we would do the even number, right? So we would have 100 to 1000, and we would have even number. So select an even number in between 100 and 1000. So we would do 100, 1000, and two. Okay, 
then in this case we would do we would have another number that will be selected 100 to 1000 so we can have it step free okay so the output of this when you run it it should give you different output every time right so yeah where's we the, can, the numbers at i'm sorry like how does it how does it come up with the numbers how does it come up with what numbers the random numbers so first part is that it's using the random number generator so this two piece is already it's already been part of the first part that you see with the ran in very much like that right and then this part with the step that it's going to step it's going to jump two numbers to generate the next number so here if we want the even number we would put in two that it's going to step two okay because it has to seed somewhere and normally you want it to seed at the you want to point to where it's going to start so at in this one we would start at 100 right and it's going to go up to 1000 as the range and it's going to stop it's going to step two for for all the even number okay now it's pseudo random so with that it's actually going to mod so it's going to skip it's not going to give you the odd number if you're doing a step two okay for the second one i don't think i put in the third part because this one was an example that I did with the skip five. So on the third, on the second one, right, we can have it where it would start at 100, stop at 1,000, and we're gonna skip, we're gonna step three, okay? So what that's gonna do is it's gonna, it's gonna break it at the middle it's going to generate it. So it's going to go from, I think I did this in reverse. Let me rerun this real quick for you. Let me fix that. Sorry. Okay, so here's my complete program. I was a little sleepy when I copied that over. I apologize. So let's look at this program real quick so you can be clear. Okay, so for the first one, right, we generate the numbers from zero to 100 using RAN range. If you don't put anything after 100, it's just gonna go, it's gonna assume that it's gonna go from zero to 100. Okay, it's gonna stop. It's gonna start at zero and it's gonna go to 100. So it's gonna give you 76. On the second one, we start at 50 and we go to 100. Okay, so here's where it's gonna start, the beginning and the end. And if you don't put in the third parameter, it's just gonna go from start to stop. 68 okay now if we want to do between 50 to 100 and it's going to skip five then we put in the third parameter five so it's going to give us 85 now if you do 50 to 100 if you want to skip 10 right it's going to start at 50 go to 100 it's gonna give us 80. Okay. So now if you want to write for your for your random number generator using ran range, okay, so you simply let me do the next line. Let's do it as R4 is equal to random. If I'm in the wrong one. So 
So we can do print random dot ran range. So we said that that would be negative 100 going to 100, right? And then we wanted to skip every 10. So it gives me negative 20. So my range becomes bigger, right? So it's gonna skip 10 and it's gonna see there at, and it's gonna give me negative 20. Professor? Yes. Oh, the way it's written, um, I thought it meant to skip the number 10. 10 as a value? Yeah, the way the number 10 is written, it says skipping 10. I thought the, I thought that meant to skip the number 10 and not. Oh, uh, yeah. And, and as far as the, the, the text display at this, or are you talking about the parameter here? Yeah, it, it steps by 10. I thought. Right. Way, it's, it's stepping by 10 as, as it generates the value. Yeah, so I should change this. Um, to make it more clear, <laughs> sorry. Oh. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we should change this by 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 saying it's stepping ten. So that way you don't get confused because technically oh. it's not skipping the number ten; it's okay. stepping by ten as it generates. It's Stepping by stepping by ten means like a ten, twenty, thirty, like this kind of number. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, I have a question. You when you write a code, you put the end end equal. Did you definite the end oh, equal? Yeah. That that is just that's just to format for, you know, for for my string. But you don't, you know, to separate one to the other. So this is just to show, because if you look at my output, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that is going to give me, that is going to give me the, so this, this string is up to mm -hmm. here, correct? Yes. Yeah. And then it's going to be the end of that string. So that way it would give me the number that it generates. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Oh. So that's just a format thing for the string. Okay. We'll get more into string next week again mm -hmm. as uh, as we look at, you know, string formatting a little bit more because there's a lot to string formatting. But okay. yeah, that's just a way that we can format mm -hmm. this line to, to finish. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any question with 10? We still have a little bit of time left to finish the other one. So I know that you will be able to get through it. Okay. So for the next one, it says Kevin receives the following score for his assignment 10, 96, 80, 77, and 62. Write the Python program that includes arithmetic operators to calculate and display Kevin's average score, right? And we learned earlier that we can even use the sum method where it's just gonna add it up, but technically you can add, and you know, like if you wanna be tedious, then you can say score one is 10, score two is 96, or you can make it a list and then you can use sum method to add up the, the total, right, the sum of his scores, then you would take that and you divide it by five, 
which gives you the average of Kevin's score. Okay, so there are a few ways that we can approach this. Okay, so I don't think I did one, but let me see. If not, I can write it real quick. Okay, it's not. So you can go in and also I want to point out in your notes, it tells you, it talks about chapter six, talks about operator, right? We went over this starting with, you know, the last lab already. So we have addition operator, add value, subtraction, subtract values or minus values. Multiplication uses the asterisk. Division is the slash, divides the value. Modular, modulo, we touch on that, that's a percentage symbol. When you're using double asterisk, that just means that it's exponent operator. And you can operate it like this in shell. So if you do, four asterisk asterisk two that you know press enter it's going to give you 16 and then you can do whole division operator okay using two slashes then it returns the whole value by dividing the first operand with the second operand so if we do seven slash slash two right it's only going to give you the quotient which is three uh three and then it's just going to forget about the rest so if you do it like this, you would get a whole number from the quotient. And those are the operators. So in the SCORE program, let me do a new one, right? So we can say Python program to calculate Kevin's average. Okay, so we have these values. Test score equal, right? And then you can have it calculate the sum. So sum score equal sum test score app scores equal sum scores oops multiply five print AVG scores I'm going to put this in here. You double check. Okay. Pretty easy, right? So I chose to use the sum method, but you can have it all added up using the operator, 100 plus 96 plus 80 plus 70 plus 62, however you wanna approach that. And then you can get the average. Question? I had a question. Sure. Is there any way that Python knows the size of the list, so you don't have to put in five, or would you have to like define? You yeah, for the list, yes. For the list, you have to give it an assignment, and it 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 determines. It kind of very much like vector in C plus plus. It determines based on the number of assignments in that list. Okay. So, yeah. So if you do size of, you have to initialize the value in that list. So that way it can determine size of. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah.
And we'll get to that. Listen, tuples is in the next few weeks. So we'll have more fun with lists and indexing. Okay. So that's a quick one. You can do it all in four or less lines. We can be a little bit more clear. You can say Kevin's test score is, or average test score is. Okay, so the next one, we're gonna have to apply some condition. I know that the chapter doesn't talk about that, but it goes over operators. And whenever I go over operators, logical operators and comparison operators, it's always good to implement conditional statement or control statement. So here's the comparison operator. If you want something to be equal to, you use double equal sign. If you want something not equal to, you would use exclamation equal sign, greater than, right? So it's gonna look at the left side compared to the right side, right? So the left side is bigger than the right side very similar to what we learn in math. Less than left side compared to the right side, and then greater than and or equal to, then we would use two. So the greater than and then the equal symbol, the equal operator. Then we would have less than or equal to. So you would use the less than plus the equal sign. And these, remember, if you just simply use this in shell, it just output true or false, right, as it compares. So when we do five less than seven, it's just going to give you true, okay? So in the case, if you're just trying to operate it with math, it's going to be, it's going to output true or false. So with the if statement format for Python, you would start with if and then you will include the test expression. So I can say if age is greater or equal to 21, and then you have to use a colon, okay? That's the trick. And then after that, you have to indent the next part, which is the following statement. So if this is the test condition, if that is true, then it's gonna execute the following statement. So for the, the, if the condition, the test expression, if it tests true, then it would execute the statement only if it's true, okay? If it's false, then it won't execute it. If we we'll only have the if statement. Now, if else, if it's false, then it's gonna go to the else section, the else body, okay? So here it gives you a little bit more layout of how the if statement would be. And remember, for Python, we would have the colon and then the statement for it to execute if the condition, if it's test true. Okay. Then for the else, if else statement, similar to that, you would have the if and the test expression and then finish that part with the colon. Then your statement, the body of if, then you would make sure that this is indented so that way it knows that it's the body of that statement. Then in the else, you don't have to indent this part. So else you would also finish it with the colon and then the body of else. So with the if else statement, the test expression, if it tests true, then it would execute the body part, the, the, the statement following, okay? If it tests false, then it's gonna jump to the else, okay? So with the if, this would only execute if it's true, and then with, same with the if else. So with the else, if it tests false here, then it's gonna go to the else, okay? So make sure that we indent properly. So now in the next one, we want to write a Python program that prompt the user to input his or her age. So we need to use the input method. If the user age is 21 or over, 
the program will display the user is a legal age limit. I did a similar one in my Java class. Otherwise, the, it display the user is under the legal age limit, provide the screen capture. So um, I'm gonna open mine up, I wrote one. Okay. So I have user age and I want to parse it as integer. So I, I, I have to include the data type for that. Otherwise it just treat it as, as string, which is not what we want because we need to make it into integer so we can compare, right? The input to the condition that we stated. So I have user age is int input enter your age. Okay. So we parse it into integer. Then we would take that value and we would put it through the test. If user age is greater or equal to 21 colon, print you meet the legal age limit. Else colon, print, sorry, you do not meet the legal age limit, or you can say you're under the legal age limit, okay? So when I run this program, it's gonna say enter your age. Let's say if I put 23, right, it's gonna tell me I meet legal age limit. Let's run it again. So if I put 13, right, sorry, you do not meet the legal age limit. So our program works. Is there a particular reason why you put double parentheses on the, the print statement? Uh, oh no, yeah, that's my, my boo-boo. <laughs> Sorry. It was super late. It was like, I, it was three in the morning. You know, my brain is in bed and I'm physically working away. Sorry. Yeah, that's my boo-boo. <laughs> I'm glad you caught that because sometimes I just, you know, but it, it did run it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, any questions? Compare this to Java, you know, it's so much simpler because Python is, you know, it has less of the requirement you know, in Java, you have to put it in main and then you got to tell it to parse and yeah, there's additional stuff and you have to include the utility for it to parse. So, so every language has rules and requirements and how it would be written, right? And as you can see with Python, we can achieve it even less, like you can make it you know, you can clean it up so much more, but yeah, I simply did like a few lines and. So the takeaway from this is when we're using if else, make sure that you have the colon, right? In the if and the else and then indent for the following statements in the body. We've done input before, so super easy. So take a screen capture of that program. Okay, any question with 12? Okay, so for 13, um, it asks you to write the program that prompt the user to input his or her annual income and years of years at the current job for home loan qualification. Uh, the user can qualify for home loan if the annual income is greater or equal to $70,000 and years of the current job is five years. And I did a similar one to this in my in my C++ class and also my 17 or my CIS 7, uh, you know, teaching them how to use logical operator. 
Okay, and the program should contain if else statement, logical operator, and appropriate output messages. Okay, so we already know the criteria. Our if statement should have this and the five years. So we want to tie it together. So if in the case where if they meet one or the other, right, that's not going to work because we want to make sure that the people, pay, you know, have the job to get the income to pay back the loans. So from a banking perspective, a lot of the times they have, you know, criteria that are tied together. And so we would use the and. So I have one created for you. Home loan. So here's my program, and of course you can do better, right? So I have annual income. I wanted to make this as int. So when they input it, it can use that value to compare, like what we did with the previous one with the 21 years and over. So I just simply ask the user to input the annual income. And then for the years working, I also want to parse this as integer. So I want to have the user input the years at the current job. And in this one, I use the and operator here, which is the logical operator, to tie the two together. So I put if annual income is greater or equal to 70,000, and years of working is greater or equal to five, colon, print you qualify for the home loan, else, colon, print you do not qualify for the home loan. And yes, we can, you know, look into input validations or you can have it prompt where, you know, yes or no. There are many ways that you can approach this type of program, but, you know, so this is the way that I had it written. So when I run this, so it asked me what is the annual income. So let's say that the user put $30,000 and seven years at that job, right? It should say you do not qualify for the home loan because it didn't meet the first part. So in this if, those two criteria, the two conditions must be met, okay, for me to qualify. So I only met one, so it did not qualify me. And then if we run this again, and let's test it with, let's say that the user makes $80,000 and at the job for three years, also did not qualify. So our statements worked. Okay, so we'll get more into loops and control statement down the line, but this is just a preview. All right, any question? Okay, so very easy, right? So practice, if you're new at this, some of you already took programming classes, so this is a breeze. But if you're new, if you want to get better, just practice. Uh, Dr. Wen? Yes? The question uh, for the if and else, uh, if and else statement. Uh-huh. Um, just make sure I'm on the right track. For the... So I, I put down here, um, so if the text expression is set to false, it, it, um, it'll automatically execute an else statement or? Yeah, so if it test false here, which it did for both time that we try it, right? Because it, the first time that I try, I put in $30,000, so it tested false there when it compared. So it automatically skip the this line and it's gonna go to the else body. Yeah. So the else is like the otherwise, right? We we 
they didn't meet the criteria, so we tell them otherwise you don't you didn't qualify for the loan. Now, in with the and both conditions have to be met. To both conditions have to be true there in order for the next statement to execute. And that's that with the if statement, it has to test true whether you have two parts or one part as a test condition. Okay, yeah, that makes uh -huh. sense. Yeah. I'm going to make uh, just an if statement. I would have to make sure my condition works or else the, the... Yeah. If you don't have the else just with the if, right? If it doesn't test you, it's just going to stop. Oh. The program going to stop, yes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Oh, we're right on schedule, so we just got to do one more, and then that's it for the week. Okay, you can preview and read the next two chapters if you like for the next one. Okay, no question on 13. So 13, we got to make sure we use the and operator. Now, if you want to qualify them with one, at least if they meet one condition, then you can use the or, right? So you can tap, you know, if they have high enough annual income, but they're new at that job, if you want to still qualify them, then you can use the or. So as long as it tests for one condition that's true, then it's going to qualify them. So that's the main difference with the logical operator, okay? So, and you can look at um, some of the specifics here. So it tells you the and both operands need to be true. Both parts need to be true. With the or, at least one. So if the first one is true, then that's fine. Or if the second one is true, then that's okay. So if you want one of the conditions to be met out of the two, you can use the or. If you want both of them that they need to be met to be true, then you can use the and. And then you can use not, right, to true if the operand is false. So the complement of the operand. And then it goes into the assignment operator. So this kind of gives you a little bit more on the compound operator, right? Like when you do an A plus equal five is actually A is equal to A plus five. I know that some of my beginner programming students, they struggle with this because they still don't understand, you know, there's two processes in that, right? It first assign and you know, and it's self-adding is the second process. So here I give you a chart or a table and it breaks down the specific. So it gives you the example so you can see. Okay. And we would apply at least one operator in our assignment, the last one. So let's do it real quick for the last few minutes. Okay, so coffeeforless.com sells gourmet coffee beans at $10 per pound. The store offers 10% discount when the customers make $100 or more in purchase, in one purchase. Write a Python program that determines the customer discount based on the amount of coffee purchase. So we have to ask the user to input the number of pounds that they, ha they, they want to purchase or they purchase. The program must contain compound operator if else statement and appropriate messages displaying about discount qualification. Provide the screen capture for script and output. So I have one and this is my approach. You don't have to make it exactly like mine. So, but I wanna show you mine so you can get an idea. When you read that, you should say, oh, well, it would have an input, it would have this kind of output. <clears throat> so I spent a little bit more time in this, like a minute more. <laughs> I put print, <clears throat> welcome to Coffee for Less. 
So, you know, like Chris was saying last week that you want to kind of give more information, right? So that way you don't want the customer to really guess. So I put down print, we offer 10% discount for $100 or more on one purchase. And then for my input, I have customer purchase, cus purchase, and I wanna parse that as integer because I wanna use the comparison later, right? Um, so int input, enter the amount of coffee you want to purchase in pounds. Okay. Then I use the compound operator. So I take the number of pounds that they input and I multiply it by 10. So technically that's $10, right? So I can also put the dot zero zero if I want. If customer purchase is greater or equal to 100, then I would take that discount and I would apply it. So I would calculate the discount, which is 10% of their purchase price. Then I print it. So this is the discount that you get. And this is the, the your purchase with the discount applied. Else, I would tell them to qualify, you need to make $100 or more in the purchase. Your current purchase right now is this, right? So when they see that, they possibly would want to buy more coffee. So here, let's say that I made 12 pounds in the, so 12 pounds, I bought, so I get 10% discount, which is $12. And the cost of my purchase with the discount is 108. Now let's run this again. Let's say that if we made less, so if I bought eight pounds instead of 12 pounds, right, it should kick it to else. And it tells me that in order to qualify, I need hundred dollars or more in my purchase and right now my purchase is eighty dollars because I bought eight pounds okay so that's my program for number 14 or the last one so under the if I just have it check for over a hundred dollars right, equal or higher than $100. And then if it did, then I calculate the discount applying the 10%. And then I print the discount and I print the cost, the purchase minus the discount because we wanted to take whatever they bought, subtract the 10%. So that way they have, they know that would be their actual cost. Else I tell them that they need to buy more, right? because this is their current purchase cost. Okay. Once you're done, save your, all your programs in case you need it later. Um, save your document with the screen capture or the files, and then you can upload that to lab three. And then you're going to go ahead and type in your full name for attendance in case I need to check after I pull attendance. I usually input it a day or two later where because the report takes a little bit for me to dig through. But um, and then if you don't have class with me at five, have to have a wonderful evening. If I'll see you here next week on Monday. We had a holiday last Monday. So but I'll see you here next week on Monday. Okay. Have a good week. Uh, Dr. Wen? Yes. One more question. Sure. Um, I learned about uh, defining functions, um, but I was wondering if you could return a statement without using a function or is that only specifically for a function like the return statement 
So there are some functions that's going to give you return value and some functions don't. It depends on the type of functions you're using. So like, for example, if you're using sum, it's going to give you the, the, the return value would be the total, right, of all the values that it adds up in that list. Okay. So if you're talking about built-in functions for Python, right, there are, yeah, the, if you're looking at the ones that we talked about so far, like abs and sum and min and max, yeah, those will actually give you return value. So you can just have it, you know, if you in shell, it would show the value, but if you in, when you're writing in text editor, you just have it print, print that value. Oh. Yeah. But not all would give you, if, you know, there's specific function for specific things. So it's best to look at the documentation, right? To really determine. So far we've been working with the majority of them. Yes, they return values. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Oh, well, I'll see you next Monday. Have a great day. <laughs> Thank you. You too. Bye. Any other questions? Okay, no other questions? Okay, I wish you all have a wonderful rest of the week. And if you don't have any questions, I'll see you next Monday. Bye. Oh, Melissa, for the display of two decimal point, uh, for the round, yeah, let me open that up. I'll show you real quick before I take off. You simply pass the two in the parameter. Let me see if it will open up for me here. Let me open it in idle. So you, you would put the two as a value for the decimal point with the variable. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I don't know why I was talking for a while and I couldn't hear, uh, it wouldn't work. Um, I see how to do it for the round. I was wondering if there's a way we could just do it on the last example for the total cost to, on the discount. Yeah. Yeah, so you when you print it, you can round it. Oh, okay. I get what you're saying now. Yeah, oh, like okay. pass, pass a method inside another method. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. See you next Monday. Yeah, yeah. Okay, bye.